Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another English lesson. Now I know my hair. I know how it looks. You don't have to make fun of me. I know how it looks. It's just a monsoon. Don't worry about it. Uh, anyway, so today we'll be focusing on your Hornbill textbook, and we'll be look, taking a look at the chapter. We're not afraid to die if we can all be together. Now I know we had a conversation that you wanted me to do Ranga's marriage, and I said I don't want to do Ranga's marriage. Uh, it's just because I wasn't really in the mood to like. Uh, delve into that thing like you know the whole indian culture thing and the whole indian style of writing is not really my forte uh, when i was i was doing my masters when i was doing my masters in english literature by the way uh, so my focus was mainly on american literature modern english literature and western literature so i never really studied indian literature that's the reason why i don't like teaching it i will eventually but i'll have to prepare for it a little bit before that So this chapter is written by people called Gordon Cook and Alan East. Now I spent a lot of time on the internet trying to research this chapter, trying to find what these people look like, who these people are, and I haven't found a single photograph. Uh, so make of that what you might, uh, because this might be like just an old, very old NCERT chapter. Like this might even be from the 70s, I guess, or like the late 80s, and uh, there isn't really any information about these people on the internet. Which is strange, like which is what I find strange is like hasn't the NCERT checked their own syllabus? Haven't they like tried to like verify? Oh, maybe like let's check like if these people who are writing it are actually alive or not? Because for example, like because yeah, it says 1976, right? And like uh, none of these people, like the writers of this uh, chapter, like Gordon Cook and Alan East, I tried looking for them online and I couldn't find anything. Like there was no information. Like there was like literally. Uh, one or two pages about somebody like whose name was Cook, who was a sailor. I'm not talking about like Captain James Cook, like the guy who sailed on the world, <laughs> not that guy, but like somebody related to this guy, you know, Gordon Cook or Alan East. Like I tried to find them and I couldn't. And uh, I don't know if this is from like a book or something. If this is an excerpt from a book, uh, like a larger novel, or this is like just like a one. Time article that was published in a newspaper in the 70s, and then NCERT somehow got their hands on it and put it into a book, which is the reason like why I keep complaining about the course being outdated and everything else. It's because like look at this, I can't find any information for you guys. And uh, personally, like if I had to give you a chapter about seafaring and everything else, life on the sea, life on the rough waters, I would have like taught you guys life of pi. Uh, I don't know if you. Heard of Life of Pi? If you've seen the movie, because like the book is actually more important. Like I read the book when I was uh, a graduate student. I think in my second year I read the book. Uh, Life of Pi is actually a very very interesting book. If you get the time, you should read the book. Like the movie leaves out a lot of stuff behind because, like I said, uh, it can't really show you everything. They've done a fantastic job with the movie. Don't I mean? Don't take it lightly or anything. Like it's an incredible movie, like incredibly done technically as well. You know, like the achievements of CGI and all of that, like oh, is incredible. And it's directed by Ang Lee, I think. Also, the guy who's in uh, Life of Pi, like the guy who plays like grown up Pi, was my senior from college. I don't remember his name, but like I know he was my senior from college because when the movie came out, like he was like in college doing talks and everything else. That I was a student from Stephens, and then I went to America, and then this and that. So fun fact, like I went to school, I went to college with the guy who played Pi in Life of Pi. I mean, he was my senior, like two years my senior. I was in fourth year, he was in the final year. So it was basically that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so Life of Pi is actually like a much more interesting story, much more interesting book, or like I would just say like a much more interesting tale in general than this. Uh, because like uh, this is like I'm not saying this is a bad story or anything. Like this is plenty of exciting if you might want to call it. But I didn't find it very exciting. Uh, I didn't find it very fun to read, to be honest. And everything else like this, we are not afraid to die if we can all be together. Like this just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, because I've read a lot of survival novels. I've read like a lot of stuff like from uh, you know shipwreck survivors or people trying to survive a storm or seafaring stories and everything else. Uh, in fact, my best friend was in the merchant navy for many many years, and I've heard his stories of being stuck in storms. You know, and stuck in storms in a giant cargo container where he was telling me uh, like the waves are bigger than our ship. Like, and his ship was massive. Uh, so I've heard stories from other people as well, other sailors as well, and they were told much better than this. Like, you know, they were told actually like in a proper way, and they had like much more adventure. So uh, I'll be putting uh, links in the video, or I'll be putting like you know uh, more resources in this video. I'll take a little bit of time with this chapter. We'll do like one video right now, and we'll do one video later. 
Uh, so I'll just divide it because like there's a lot of information that's uh, not pertinent to the chapter, which is like uh, interesting to know in this. Oh, one second. Yeah, so there's a lot of information like regarding like seafaring and you know sailing and stories about storms and how do storms happen in the seas, like how does circumnavigating the globe work, what is life on a ship like. Uh, those are the interesting things that I think we can draw from this. And then like I am saying like we'll do two big uh, chapters because uh, there will be one video where I want to like just delve into the philosophical issues of life and death and you know like what does family mean like what what are the philosophical implications of you know being in a situation where your entire family is uh, having their lives threatened like your lives could end at any moment and what do you do in such a in such a situation what do you do how do you try to get out of it how do you try to make your way through it and all of that. Uh, the reason why I'm not editing this intro video anymore, like I won't be editing a lot of my videos anymore is because I kind of want to have like a free flow in conversation uh, and plus like it's really hard to edit videos that are like longer than 40 minutes because it takes a long time. Uh, so I'll try to like uh, keep the editing to a minimum. I am working on scripts actually at the moment so like what I do is like before I make a video I write a script and then I do the video so that uh, gives me much less chances of making errors that require editing and that require you know multiple takes anyways i don't know why i'm boring you with this stuff like you don't really care about any of this uh, so we'll just take a look at the chapter together so right now like we'll just go through it like you know just generally like overview and everything else and then like i'll make another video where i'll try to delve into more into you know seafaring stuff and like what does it actually mean like what is the uh, literary and cultural importance of the sea and writing and everything else how were sailors, you know, one of the first adventures in this world? How were like sailors accounts one of the first adventure novels in this world? Uh, because a lot of sailors, you know, set out to sail and they would write stories and they would write about, you know, islands and that's where they like the myths of the mermaids and the sirens and everything else. So like sailors have been like our earliest storytellers. They were the ones, you know, who would explore, they were the ones who would like, you know, try to find what is beyond the horizon, what lies there, what island is there. Uh, if I go through this current, what happens to me? So it's very interesting to read about sailors' accounts, especially like from like the early 1800s and 1600s and 1700s. It's pretty interesting to read about them. Uh, it was like there were books like you know Robinson Crusoe, uh, Treasure Island, you know the Swiss Family Robinson. Uh, these were all classics written like you know in the 1800s, late 1800s, turn of the century. These were all about you know shipwrecks or like you know pirates or sailing or everything else. And these are really good books. So if you get a chance to read, like I'll, uh, if you want, like you can reach out to me. I'll provide you links to all of these books. So you can read Robinson Crusoe, you can read Swiss Family Robinson, you can read Treasure Island, and there's different books as well. You know, so you can read all of these. And I also want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, like the journey of Theseus, like his story, the Odyssey, Odysseus, and his story. Uh, because that was like one of the first prime examples of a voyage, you know, Odysseus and his voyage, and like Theseus and his voyage, and these are all like stories from Greek mythology. So we can do that as well. That's the reason why I wanted to take a little bit more time with this video. So this is basically the intro and the overview. So now I'll just stop it now, and then we'll move on towards the chapter, and I'll try to go through the explanations and everything. All right. So uh, pay attention, make notes, and if you have any questions, bring it up during the online lecture. Building behind him. 
Ian had been warned the Southport bar was treacherous. This morning he'd heard over the marine radio whale watching tours had been cancelled for the day. But sensing a gap in the sets, he went for it. Oh my God! Oh Jesus! Oh Jesus! Sultanay was launched ahead of the wave, but Ian kept the cat on a straight line, pushed by the foaming white water. 20 seconds later, they were through. How do sailboats sail into the wind? So, you probably know that this is a sailboat. You probably also know that sailboats move because the wind pushes the sail, right? But did you know that it is also possible for a sailboat to sail into the wind? What? No way! Crazy, right? This is possible because of the Bernoulli Principle. It was published by mathematician and physicist Daniel Bernoulli in 1738. To understand this principle, let's first talk about a force called lift. Lift is one of the forces an airplane uses to fly. It pushes objects up, against gravity. Lift occurs because of a change in pressure between the top and bottom of a surface. This is called an airfoil. As you can see, the top is curved. When the airfoil begins to move quickly through air, because of the curvature of the airfoil, the air on top of the airfoil has to travel a longer distance to get past the airfoil than the air below it. As a result, the air on top moves faster than the air below. That's where the Bernoulli principle comes in. Air is a fluid, and the Bernoulli principle tells us that when a fluid begins to increase in speed, its pressure decreases. So, when the airfoil moves, the faster air above it has lower pressure, while the slower air below has high pressure. Because of the higher pressure below, there is lift on the airfoil from below, and this causes the airfoil to move in an upward direction. Now, think of an airfoil as a wing. By the process of the creation of low and high pressure on the top and bottom of the wing during takeoff, a plane is able to lift into the sky. But how is lift defined? It's defined by the equation L equals one half rho V squared times A times C L. Rho is the density of the air, which is about 1.225 kilograms per meters cubed. V is the velocity, CL is the coefficient of lift, and A is the area of the wing. Using this equation, we can determine how much lift is needed to allow an object to fly. Okay, so now that we have understood what lift does, what does this have to do with a sailboat sailing into the wind? How can a sailboat sail into the wind? We can assume that the sail is simply an airfoil, but sideways. Here, we are looking at the sail from up above. This is the bow, which is the front. And the stern is the back of the boat. On the sail, there is a windward and a leeward side. The wind is coming from ahead. 
Some wind passes by the windward side, some on the leeward side. As you can see, the wind passing the leeward side will have to travel farther and faster, so low pressure is formed on that side. On the windward side, high pressure is formed. The result is a motion similar to an airplane during takeoff. The sailboat will move mostly sideways, but partially forward. However, on the bottom of the sailboat, underwater, is the keel. The keel counteracts the sideways motion and balances the sailboat. Therefore, the sideways forward motion is turned into just forward motion, thanks to the keel. Now, let's watch this in action. But this doesn't mean you can sail directly into the wind. For the Bernoulli principle to work on the sails, you can only sail the boat into the wind at a certain angle. On most sailboats, this is about 40 degrees away from the direction of the wind, no less. It can be more, but no less. Some more advanced sailboats can do 30 degrees from the wind, but for most, it is about 40 to 45 degrees. When sailors wish to sail directly in the direction of the wind, they perform a movement called tacking. What they do is sail the boat at, say, 40 degrees away from the direction of the wind one way, then cut across and sail the boat 40 degrees away from the direction of the wind on the other side. By moving in this zigzag form, the boat will move in the direction of the wind. Thanks to the Bernoulli principle, sailors can sail boats in any direction and airplanes are able to fly. The world would be far behind from where it is today if the Bernoulli principle had not been used in these So for the explanation, I'll go through the textbook on my own and then I'll do the explanation as I used to do in the previous videos. I won't be doing the voiceover anymore uh, because I didn't get like a response from you guys like about the voiceover. So I'll try to not do it for this video and like I'll try to avoid doing the voiceover for this video. I'll just do like my talking thing and I'll add like information at the end. Uh, if you want like the voiceovers back, let me know. So I'll do the voiceovers like uh, I'll put a page on the screen and then I'll talk about it, which was I was doing in the previous videos. So if you want me back to that, let me know for like the next video, I'll do that. But for now, I'll just like, you know, go over the chapter like quickly. Like I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just going to point out certain things that stick out in my mind, like in the first reading. And I'll ask you guys to like, you know, find out the meanings of these words and look it up and prepare for the online lecture. Basically, uh, this is just like the preparation for the online lecture. And then once we'll have an online lecture, then I'll make another video where I'll go into like the details and everything else and go into the breakdowns and I'll do the voiceovers for that video because uh, that might be more technical so I'll do uh, the voiceovers for them. Uh, for this video you can just stare at my stupid face and you can like follow along the chapter with me. So I'm at page number, what is this, wait, okay page number 13 so we are not afraid to die, I think and all will be together. I hope you guys can see this, this is like the Hornbill copy that I'm using. Okay so I hope you guys are following along with your textbook. So, first of all, notice these expressions in the text, infer the meaning from the context. Now, I've, I've been doing this with you guys a lot, and I've been asking you guys to follow along with this. So, these are the expressions, you have to infer the meaning from the context, which means don't look up the dictionary at first, try to find out the meaning by your own reading, uh, by your own comprehension, and then try to match that meaning to the dictionary, and that will be like much more easier for you to understand, and that will help you improve your language a lot. Okay, don't just straight up go to the dictionary first, try to find out the meaning on your own, try to like match the sentences, match the words, try to make sure like uh, what context has it been used in, you know, like try to understand the entire situation where this phrase or this expression has been used in and then try to find its meaning on your own and then match that meaning with that of the dictionary and then you'll understand like, okay, uh, this is the meaning that I'm looking for, this is the word that I'm looking for and you'll remember it. Alright, so the expressions that have been given to you are honing our seafaring skills. 
pinpricks in the vast ocean, ominous silence, a tussled head, mayday calls. <clears throat> so and these are all the examples that have been given to you. Okay, so you can look them up and you can find them out, you can infer the meaning from context. Do it in your rough notebook, don't do it in your fair notebook yet, don't do anything in your fair notebook yet. Uh, I don't know if you've done this with the previous teacher or not, so we'll have to have a conversation online before I tell you guys like what to do fair and what not to do fair. So, in July 1976, my, my wife Mary, son Jonathan, six, daughter Suzanne, seven, and I set sail from Plymouth, England to duplicate the round the world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook. Now, once again, this is written in the 70s. So, 1976, uh, there wasn't a lot of high-tech equipment available on the seas. Uh, right now, what we have is like satellite imaging, satellite computers and everything else. So, you can have like lifetime feed of when a storm is developing. You can have live feeds of whatever the, the weather conditions may be, what the ocean temperature is like, what the tides are like, what the current is like. So, there's a lot of information that is available to sailors now due to the advances in technology than it was available back in the like, even in the 70s. Uh, trust me, like the 1970s equipment was much better than the equipment sailors used in the 1910s and the 1800s. So there has been progression, but like uh, comparing 1976 equipment to like 2021 equipment is just like apples and oranges. You can't really compare the two things. So the story is written in 1976, so a pretty old story, and uh, so you should understand like that's the reason why like a lot of the references in the story are pretty old because it is written in the 70s. So uh, we are being uh, talked. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there was something in my throat. So we have been uh, told the story from like the perspective of the narrator, of the author. So this is a, his first person perspective, I guess. Okay, in July 1976, my wife Mary, my son Jonathan Six, daughter Suzanne and I set sail from Plymouth, England. Alright, so it's I, whenever there is I in a story, I've told you it's the first person perspective, right? Now the tenses might be different, he might be using the past progressive tense or the past participle tense, but he is still talking in the first person voice. That is his POV that we are looking at the story from, right? POV means point of view. So that is his point of view that we are uh, understanding the story from, that we are uh, looking at the story from, okay? In July 1976, my wife Mary's son, Jonathan six, daughter Suzanne seven. So now his kids are six and seven years old. Now this is what I don't understand. Like uh, six and seven year olds are very hard to travel with. People can't really travel with six and seven years old like in trains or in airplanes like because they're really hard to control. They're really hard to you know settle down and everything else. And these people decide to take six and seven year olds on a voyage around the world on a ship in 1976. So, questionable parenting decisions aside, like because I'm not going to judge them for their parenting skills because I'm not a parent, I'm never going to be a parent, I don't want to be a parent, so because of the simple reason like that, like uh, all this responsibility is too much for me. I can't even think about myself like taking the responsibility of another human being because I am still a man child myself. <laughs> like as you can see there's like guitars, there's gaming headphones, there's books, everything else in the background, like this is not something like, you know, a parent does or something. So. Questionable decision taking like your six-year-old uh, son and your seven-year-old daughter on you with a voyage around the world. I don't agree with it. Maybe you do. Maybe you think that's fun. So if you think that's fun, then it's fine, I guess. Uh, because like a simple sail is fine, you know, like if you're sailing for the day and you're taking your kids out on the boat fishing, cool. But you're taking your kids out on a boat and trying to sail around the world. I mean, uh, I like... Um, you look at it, for the longest time, Mary and I, a 37-year-old businessman, had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer. And for the past 16 years, we had spent all our leisure time honing our seafaring skills in British waters. Uh, now, like you can see, these are not professional sailors. These are amateur sailors, right? Amateur sailors mean like they don't make their living on the sea. They're not like fishermen or they're not like, you know, merchant navy members. Uh, he's just a simple businessman, his wife. Uh, there's not a lot of information given about what his wife does. But basically what they were saying is like they've been amateur sailors for 16 years. They've been practicing on like around the British coast, which makes sense. Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, 16 years of sailing around the British coast as an amateur and then going around the world, you know, with your family, quite a huge decision. Uh, people forget to like respect the sea a lot. People don't respect the sea as much as they should. Do you talk to any sailor, anybody who spent any amount of time on the water, they will tell you something. If you stop respecting the sea, the sea will take you and it will drown you and you will never ever be found again. So the sea is always to be respected. I've never been to the, like I've never been sailing. I've been to the sea like once or twice in my life, which was very long ago. 
uh, I am not like a water person. I like swimming, don't get me wrong. Like I like swimming in lakes, I like swimming in pools, I don't like swimming in the ocean. So Abbe, a board wave walker, a 23 meter, 30 ton wooden hull beauty had been professionally built and we had spent months fitting it out and testing it in the roughest weather we could find. Now their boat is called the wave walker, you know, like ships are called, uh, given names and just remember that ships are referred to as she, right? All ships are female, just like all planes are female. You know, and all cars are female, so all cars will be called she, all ships will be called she, and all aeroplanes will be called she. Uh, I don't know why that is, this rule wasn't like, you know, really explained to me, it's just because like sailors and everybody else from like times immemorial have been like naming their ships like female names, you know. Uh, Christopher Columbus had like three ships which he uh, took to discover America, they were called the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, so they were like all three female names. Uh, those were like the only female, <laughs> those were like the only famous ships I remember actually. Uh, Nina, Pinta and Santa Maria is because like those are the three ships Christopher Columbus used to you know land in America. I don't remember a lot of famous ships like I'm not really a sea kind of a guy, not really into naval history and naval warfare. Uh, wasn't really my jam, I'm more into like you know uh, infantry warfare or like other stuff like history, modern war history and everything else. Not really into naval history so. Uh, I do know a little bit about ships because like I said my best friend was in the merchant navy and when he was studying for his like you know officer training exams I used to help him out so I do know a little bit about it uh, but not enough like I would never call myself an expert on and I would never try to answer anybody's questions or queries whenever they have like a technical question about sailing. So 30 ton wooden hull beauty. Now wooden hull means like the front part of the boat right. So hull is like uh, so for example if this is the boat. Uh, take a look at this so this might be a boat like just use your imagination so this would be considered the hull right so this would be covered up this would be like the top this would be the deck of the ship and this is the hull of the ship like the outside body of the ship which is in contact with water basically the part of the ship that is inside the water is called the hull yeah that's the simplest way to understand it okay and it had been professionally built we had spent months fitting it out and testing it out in the roughest weather we could find so they're kind of preparing uh, kudos to them once again, I am not. I do not support taking like six and seven year olds on like a tour around the world on a board, especially like a thirty ton wooden hulled board. So the first leg of our planned three year, one hundred and five thousand kilometer journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. Now three year, one hundred and five thousand kilometer journey. So you can imagine like three years to take complete this journey. Uh, three years on a board, three years sailing around the world, three years stuck on a board. I do not know. I mean, yeah, sure, I would like to go out on a sea voyage, don't get me wrong, like my friend and I have been planning on going on like uh, whenever like the seas open up for him, like whenever he goes, because right now he's stuck at home due to COVID protocol. So, but like our plan was like, I would uh, get on a ship from Bombay, we would sail all the way to Oman, and then from Oman we would go to Egypt, and from Egypt we would cross the Swiss Canal, and then like uh, we could go to Europe and Russia and everything else. That was our plan, like we would take a ship there. Unfortunately, due to COVID and everything else, all those plans got cancelled. But yeah, voyages do take a long time. Like, you know, three years makes sense, like going around the world, like you're traveling around the entire globe on a ship, which is, you know, not like a ship designed for speed. It's designed for, you know, your family to live in as well as be comfortable. So it will be slow. You know, the more stuff you have on the ship, the slower it is. It's just like that. Like, you know, if you want like a giant ship that moves fast, you'll have to put a giant engine on it. So that's just it. But yeah, it does take a long time. I'm not sure like three years. I'm not sure how this works because like I said, I'm not like a navigation expert. So three years and 105,000 kilometer journey. So not really sure how that works. But yeah, it does take a long time to circumnavigate the globe that I'm sure. And if they're saying three years, then I can make it does make sense. Like three years, you might have to take stops. You might have to, you know, uh, wait for seasons because like three years it makes sense because like there are certain sections of the oceans that you can only cross in like a, a certain season because otherwise either the waves are too high or like there's storm season like because you know the south china sea you can't cross because like there's typhoon season so you have to wait for the, the typhoon season to pass to cross the south china sea it's the same with the atlantic it's the same with the pacific there's like certain times and certain ocean currents that you have to follow and there's certain trends you have to pay attention to so it's kind of complicated, all of this stuff, like it's not very simple, that's why sailors study so much, that's why you know like the navy has so much uh, emphasis placed on you know preparing their sailors, that's why if you go into the merchant navy, if any of you are uh, planning for going into the merchant navy after your class 12, you'll have to study a lot, there's a lot of studying going on, like there's so much mathematics you have to study because you have to calculate your ship's charts and courses and calculate the weight of the ballast of the ship. 
how much fuel you have to put in and everything else. So this is all technical stuff. So if anybody is interested in going into the merchant navy, uh, you have a lot of work to do. You have a lot of study to do. Like I have, I'm not kidding. Like I've seen like my friends who are giving their merchant navy exam study more than engineering students. So just be mindful of that. All right. So they <coughs> they sailed on the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. Now look this up and your atlases or if you have maps or look it up online i'll put a video here like if i can find an animated depiction of like captain cook's journey like this entire circumnavigation of the globe i'll let you guys uh, see it i'll put it in this video as well i'll put uh, put up a video where you can see like okay this is the route that people take when they're circumnavigating the globe by a ship all right and uh, like in 1976 it would be different because like the swiss canal was open the panama canal was open so like it's pretty different like uh, circumnavigating navigating the globe in modern times there, before heading east, we took on two crewmen, American Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Siegler, to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas, the Southern Indian Ocean. Now, the Southern Indian Ocean is considered one of the world's roughest seas. I still don't know why. I haven't been to the Southern Indian Ocean, actually. Uh, so I'll look it up. I'll find out like some footage. I'll find out some documentaries on the Southern Indian Ocean, and I'll share it with you guys as well. And uh, like these guys as well, like I looked up American Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Siegler. I searched these people on Google as well. I couldn't find anything about them. Which is why the reason why like I have so little information about this chapter is because I can't really tell anything that's going on. Like I can't find any information. So that's the reason why I'm focusing more on like the naval and the maritime side of it because that's the only thing I can find information on. Okay. On our second day out of Cape Town, we begin to encounter strong gears. Now I'm at page number 14, okay? Page number 14, this is the second page, so we're just moving on with the story. So it's not very long, the story is not very difficult uh, to understand, it's pretty simple, like there's nothing that's going on, it's like a simple adventure story or a simple account or something, okay. For the next few weeks they blew continuously, gales did not worry me, but the size of the waves was alarming up to 15 meters high, as high as our main mass. Now 15 meters high, try to imagine a wave that is 15 meters high, I'll put up like uh, images of ships battling with like tall waves and everything else in this video as well. So we can look at that, okay. Uh, December 25th found us 3,500 kilometers east of Cape Town. Despite atrocious weather, we had a wonderful holiday complete with the Christmas tree. New Year's Day saw no improvement in the weather, but we reasoned that it had to change soon and it did change for the worse. Like I said, when you're in the ocean, you have to respect the sea, you have to respect the climate. Uh, these people were hoping that the climate would get better. They kept sailing when they shouldn't have and they should have stopped. I don't know, like the sailors that were with them, why they didn't tell them to stop, but like the weather was getting worse and worse. At dawn on January 2nd, the waves were gigantic. We were sailing with only a small storm jib and we're still making 8 knots. Okay, so storm jib is a kind of sail, you know, first you have like the main sail, then you have like the smaller sail. So I'll put up a link as well in the video uh, about like the different kind of sails and the explanations on why they used and what their purpose is. So basically a jib from what I was explained when I was younger was a sail that you put up to reduce your speed whenever there's like high winds blowing. Because like if you put up like the big sail in a storm, it's just going to get blown through your ship is going to get, you know, it will be really hard for you to control your ship with strong winds and a large sail. So because like the best example I can give you, like for example, next time when there is a storm outside your house, uh, try to uh, carry like a blanket out, like, you know, a double bed sheet blanket, holding the four corners, try to stand into the window and try to hold on to it. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to pull you along. But at the same time, if you have like a smaller uh, blanket, let's say, if, and it's in a triangular shape, then it'll be easier for you to like you know control that thing it'll be easier for you to you know maintain your course and even in strong winds so that's what a storm jib does that's what like different kinds of sails do they use for different purposes different amount of thrusts on the ship you know like because like the amount of wind your sail catches is like the propulsion force that your boat is using right like the more wind your sail catches the faster your boat goes so that's why that's why it was uh, he's saying like uh, only a small storm jib and we were still making eight knots now, knots is a nat uh, nautical uh, term that's used to measure speed. Now, you can look up on Google, like, how do you convert knots into kilometers per hour? And I'll try to add it to the video as well. But, like, these are things you can do yourself, people. Come on. Like, these are little things. Just Google them. Pause this video right now. Just Google what knots is. And then you'll understand, like, what it is. Like, it's basically a measurement of speed. All right? As the ship rose to the top of each wave, we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us. And the screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ears. To slow the boot down, we dropped the storm jib and lashed a heavy mooring rope in a loop across the stern. Then we double lashed everything, went through our life lav drill, attached lifelines, joined all skins and life jackets and waited. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So, as we can see, like, you know, the waves are getting bigger and bigger, they're getting stuck into the storm, all right? So we were sailing with only a small storm jib and we were still making 8 knots. As the ship rose to the top of each wave, we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us. And the screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ears. All right. Now, enormous seas rolling towards us, these, this is an image that you can only see once, like if you've seen a storm or if you've seen like any footage. So there's a movie called A Perfect Storm. You can look that up and uh, there are footage, uh, there is footage available on the internet uh, of like these giant ships going through giant waves and storms and you can see, you know, like that's the way waves work, you know, they roll up and they roll down, they roll up and they roll down, just like the wave motion, right? So that's what the sea looks like. So if you're a ship, what you do is you try to point your nose towards the wave because if you're sideways and the waves hit you, your ship tips over. But you have to go straight, you have to go straight into the wave, like, so that's what happens. So once you go into the wave, you go up the wave and then you can see in front, like, all the other waves getting ready to pop up. And it's a very scary thing to see and, like, it's a very scary thing to witness as well. So you can take a look at it, I'll add some videos here as well. So I'll just stop this video now because it's pretty long and it's a pretty long explanation. And uh, I'll just explain to you guys what this is. So, so to slow the boat down, we dropped the storm jib, like I explained. They dropped the storm jib, which was like a smaller sail because like the winds were so fast, they were pushing their boat even faster than they could control. So they dropped the sail completely. So they had no mass. They were only being controlled by the motion of the waves or the motion of the ocean or whatever engine they might have on their boat. So like they were not being propelled by the wind anymore. Okay. And lashed a heavy mooring rope in a loop across the star. Now, mooring rope is something that you use to tie your ship to like a dock or something. So what they did was they tied it across the stern. Stern means uh, in the back of the boat, I guess. I'm not really sure. Prow means the front, stern means the rear. I think I'm not a sailor. I'll have to confirm, okay? And they do this like they do uh, do the mooring rope because like it tries to, you know, it helps the ship stay together. It helps the ship stay on course. Okay, then we double lashed everything. So like lashing is a very important part of a ship because you know like on a ship anything can like get washed overboard and like the sea will carry it away. So you have to tie everything down. So this is what they're doing. Like they're going through a storm and like you know they can feel like you know okay the waves are getting bigger, the storm is getting stronger. So they have to tie everything quickly. Uh, this is what it means by the terms batten down the hatches. You know there's a term called batten down the hatches and prepare for yourself for war. So batten down the hatches was a term used in the old ships where, you know, whenever there was a storm, there were like hatches where you could go under the deck or you could go under the deck. So you had to like tighten them down, seal them and everything else. This is what they're doing. They're tying everything down and if you're on a ship, like you have to wear oil skins. Oil skins are like water repellent clothing. They're called oil skins. So you have to wear them. So if you fall into the sea, you don't die of a cold immediately. And then you have to wear life preservers or life jackets and they have to make sure their life rafts are available to them, you know. Life raft drill, basically, that's what it means. Like, you have to be practicing, like, whenever, like, if your ship is going down, if your ship is going into the water, then you have to make sure that you can get rid of your life raft and get into it at the same time, you know? So this is very important. Like I said, uh, it's very dangerous, it's very scary. That's why you need, like, years and years of training to, like, be called a proper sailor, to be, you know, uh, actually able to go out and sail in the oceans and everything else, okay? So we'll end this here. And then the next video, I'll do the more uh, other explanations and everything else, the technical side of things. And uh, we'll do a discussion about this video and the online lecture where we have it tomorrow. So if you have any questions or anything else, uh, just ask me. Go through the entire chapter on your own, by the way, people. Like, you should be able to go through the entire chapter on your own. Uh, look up the difficult words and everything else that is bothering you. And I'll try to provide you notes uh, tomorrow. I'll try to provide you with PDF notes, like detailed PDF notes this time. I will try my best because like I said I'm not a sailor so this is not my forte so I will also have to like uh, research and I will also have to find information for you guys as well so anyways I hope you guys have fun